A is from microcredit and micro, from microcredit to microfinance, Grameen 2.0, brought to you by the Canadian CEP network. We're a national network of several hundred local organizations and individuals working to create local economic opportunities that support an inclusive and sustainable economy. Here you can see a few of our members' logos. If you like the session today, consider joining us by becoming a member or signing up for our free e-newsletters. The session today is uh, part of a series. Past sessions include topics such as the versatility of co-ops, the resilience imperative, social impact bonds, financial management for sustainability, and others. All of these past sessions are on our website. And the session today is also made possible with the support of UNITERRA, the biggest Canadian international volunteer cooperation program that helps reduce poverty and inequalities in 12 countries across Africa, Latin America, and Asia. UNITERRA supports organizations in developing countries that work to improve living conditions in their communities and actually help support it, uh, one of the examples we'll be looking at with the Mutual from Guinea today. So if you'd like to find out more about UNITERRA and their volunteer opportunities, visit uniterra.ca. We also have a couple of upcoming webinars on social return on investment and current social economy research in Canada which profile recent innovations and feature some of the leading experts in Canada. So consider joining us for those. The session today is divided into two parts. The first part will be presentations by Emilio and Yvon. Uh, those will last about 30 minutes. And then in the second part, we'll answer the questions that you pose in, your chat box, in the chat box on the webinar. But before we get to the presentations, Let's get a sense of who's on the session today with a quick poll of participants. You should see two polls that have just popped up on your screen that you can uh, answer, one inquiring about your interest in the session, and the other how familiar you are, you are with what a mutual actually is. While you uh, answer those questions, I'll do my quick intro for the session. In recent years, and especially since Mohammed Yunus won the Nobel Prize in 2008, Microcredit has flourished around the world. It's a tool that's supposed to lift people, especially women, out of poverty. But its global evolution has met challenges and limits in some places, and CET and social economy organizations have sought strategies to take the practice further. One of those strategies made an important step forward recently. Last December, Quebec's National Assembly adopted Bill 201, creating the Quebec Microfinance Mutual. Here at SEDNET, we wanted to highlight this Canadian first, not only because it's a marvelous example of innovation, but also because it's innovation sp inspired by CED, Community Economic Development Principles, a poverty reduction tool that simultaneously empowers its users through control of the tool itself. And that tool is one that's not all that well known, in fact, a mutual. So we're very pleased to present to you today two microfinance mutuals, the Farmers uh, and Fishers Savings and Credit Union Mutual of Guinea, known by its French acronym MECRIPAG, and the Quebec Microfinance Mutual. So before we get into um, our uh, first presentation, let's have a quick look at the poll responses. We have an, a number of people, a few organizations that do microcredit, one investor, that's terrific. Um, a number of people are just interested in finding out more or expanding microcredit services and some others, uh, which uh, all reporting to partners, yeah, that's a, 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 good, uh, a good reason for, for being here. And I see there's a few people who are at least as old as me and remember uh, Mutual Omaha's World Kingdom, which I have to confess reveals my level of ignorance about mutuals. When we started preparing for this session, I had to do some research as well. So a number of people who actually know what mutuals are about, that's great. And, uh, and a few who, who aren't really sure, as I was uh, coming into this. So hopefully we'll have a better sense by the end of the webinar. So our first presenter today is Emilio Lopez. Emilio, originally from Venezuela, has more than 12 years of experience in the international finance industry, specializing in planning, management, marketing, finance, and microfinance. He worked for the largest commercial banks in Venezuela, and in the microfinance field, he was business manager for Banquente. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. The first <laughs> Venezuelan microfinance bank. Banquente. Banquente. The first Venezuelan microfinance bank. This organization won the Mixed Market Prize three times and was part of the Acción Internacional Network. 
Emilio has an undergraduate degree in civil engineering, very well-rounded, and a master's in finance. He's currently a consultant and financial analyst with the Fonde Brunt Quebec. Thanks for joining us, Emilio. Thank you very much, Mike. Great. So, I'm, of course, we're very interested to hear more about the Fonde Brunt Quebec's innovative new project, the Mutual. But before we can talk about it, I think it's important to understand the challenges that led you to create it. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for giving us the time to talk about our project this afternoon. Well, today is the first time we will take in, uh, talking about our institution in English. We have done presentation in French and Spanish, but today is the first time in English, and thank you very much. What are the challenge? The first one, we're starting uh, with the most important challenge in this project. We can say that the first one is a consistency between the vision and, and the mission. For us, it was really important to review what we were doing and how, and especially uh, where we want to go. The second one, innovation. Innovation, well, because this project is, is a good example of innovation. As we will see later, we are not satisfied with what exists here in Quebec. We take in many experience from around the world, and we decided we wanted to do something different. Uh, over time, we realized that we had to, to ask for, for a special act, and we worked hard, and, and we got it on December 2012. And number three, growth and profitability. It, it, it is a little bit difficult to talk about growth and profitability at the same time, but it should go hand in hand, and we're working on it. We're preparing our processes and technological system to cope with the huge impact that the, the change will mean in terms of volume of customers, client, and, and process. The thing is what we are doing is implementing a new institution based on the experience we already have in the Fond and Prend Quebec, but at the same time, this institution will have a larger scale and greater diversity, diversity of, of products and services. That, um, that isn't really, really important. And governance, when we consider launching a microfinance institution, we were not sure of the legal form that it should take. But uh, we were sure of uh, was uh, we wanted the active participation of clients. Uh, and everyone could feel identified with the institution. And the most important aspect is that everyone has the right speak and, and to be here. And number five, access. Access, well, it's a key issue when we talk about microfinance because we're talking about products and services to, the, to a, group, a group of people with specific needs. Uh, so these products and services must be designed and implemented to, to meet those needs. So clients have a lot to say about the operation. It's really important for all the clients. And the last one, transition. Well, transition, the transition from an existing organization to a new model, bigger and more ambitious, for sure, is always something to be evaluated. We continue to improve our services, and we are working to generate a positive impact for, for our client, but it's really hard the transition between these two, two organizations. Okay. So why don't um, you start off by giving us some background on the Fond d'Emprunt Québec itself? Okay. Well, I, um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about Fond d'Emprunt Québec. The Fond d'Emprunt Québec is a non-profit organization founded in 1997 which is also a registered charity organization. It supports projects in the region of Quebec, Capital Nacional, uh, here in Quebec. And the mission that is really important uh, is to mobilize investors to provide access to credit and support for low-income people who have a, an idea or, or a business plan. You will see later how this mission is extended to generate a great impact with implementation of the mutual uh, of the La Mutual de Microfinance, because we are talking about just credit and low income. We, on the other hand, we have partners, important partners with whom we have worked over the years, and, and we have joint projects, collaborations, 
service agreement, but the, the four most important partners in the, in the process of launching this project are CELDE de Quebec, Bureau de la Capital Nacional, Conference Regional de CELU de la Capital Nacional, and Réseau d'Investissement Social de, de Quebec. Are these also your investors, or who, who are the investors in the Fonds d'Emprunt Québec? Uh, well, we talk, we talk about partners. Regarding okay. investors, I can say that we have a great number of people and institutions that have uh, support us over the years and continue to do so. I, I can say that we have private companies, individuals, foundations, unions, religious communities, and, uh, of course, the Yardin. Mm -hmm. you, you are fairly well known and recognized, uh, as, as your slide here suggests, and, and also in part uh, because you're involved in international work as well, eh? Oh, yeah, yes. Um, international, we have participated in, in technical assistance programs in a few countries, as Egypt, France, Mali, AC. Here in Quebec, we receive visits from four institutions in partnership with TESI, Socodevi, Development International de Jardin. Uh, in fact, a couple of week, weeks ago, we received a, a delegation from Guatemala. Uh, well, additionally, <laughs> I think it's important to tell you, we have uh, on our team people who have had experience in microfinance around the world, for example, in Latin America, Africa, and Europe which help us a lot during our meetings and discussions. Okay. Um, and so what has Fondant Pont Quebec been able to accomplish over the last 15 years of its existence? Well, first of all, I have to say that we have, uh, in, as a services, we have microcredit and consulting. Our microcredit is up to $40,000, and consulting is, it's educational program. Uh, uh, the result of the 15 years of work, well, until March 2012, we can say that we lent $2.7 million, which generated $11.5 million in project costs. Um, when 2012, with uh, $1.4 million of uh, capital to lend, with 2,500 uh, people who have been served and oriented, and more than 500 jobs created. But the, the indicator of which we are proud of are the two that follow. For example, survival rate of 68% of the startups after the five years compared to 33% overall in Quebec, well, it's really important for us. And, well, the last one, the reimbursement rate of 91%, uh, well, that, uh, are really important for us. And that, of course, is dealing with a clientele that a mainstream financial in, uh, institutions would consider high risk. Yes. So it's all, all the more impressive. Um, despite those results, uh, was there Fond des Francs Québec came to a point where you felt that you weren't meeting the potential demand for your services? You weren't meeting the need? Well, in fact, we had a study made in 2008 to figure out the, the amount of potential clients, and, and the demand was very large, and that is the most important reason why we, we are here right now. No? But the problem is to seek a business model that allows us to, to be more efficient to meet those needs, but it's, 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 really, it's really hard to work with this, 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 uh, this market. No? Um, well, I have to say, too, that uh, following the crisis of 2008 and 2009, we realized that it was uh, very important to us and our clients to offer uh, more products and services, and thus to help uh, others in difficult times. So we decided to implement a microfinance institution. All the time we, we are thinking about microfinance institution, not no really as mutual, co-op, or, or whatever, just microfinance institution. Then we decided that should should move for a model of microcredit to a much more complete model, which will help a lot more people who need us. Then we analyze uh, existing model uh, in Africa, Europe, and, and Latin America. Then, a minute, okay. 
then uh, we move from the notion of microcredit, that means small loans to people in precarious income, to, to microfinance, providing a range of financial products. That means loans, savings, insurance. That, uh, that really, really important for us. And so these new services, they represent a, a significant change to the Fondo Pro Quebec's mission. A, well, in fact, it will not change, but, but instead it will, it will grow. We think it will grow. For example, the, the mutual mission is to offer financial products and services to individuals who have difficult gaining access to traditional financial networks. When we compare to the mission of uh, Fond and Prong, we have mobilize, to mobile, mobilize investors to provide access to credit and support for loan income, just the loan income people and just credit. Then we're, we're changing that. We're changing to financial products, as I said, loans, uh, savings, insurance, and we're changing the people too. It is more larger and can help more people because it's not just low income people and not, and not just microcredit. For us, that means uh, financial security. Yes, for sure. And so, so for, for example, I, I, I have a, I have an example. We have cases of immigrant clients with master degrees and PhDs who are in situation of underemployment, as, as, as I said, Linda, our <laughs> CEO, or having trouble getting employed and decide to fund their company. Maybe they are not real low-income people, but they have, they have problem having, having the money from the bank. Right. They don't have a credit history here. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're collateral. So. Um, and so what led you to choose a mutual structure for the, the new collection of services? Uh, well, as I said at the beginning, when I was talking about the access, we, we made a choice and decided La Mutual de Microfinance instead of a, of a private company because we wanted a, a collective enterprise, the social and solidarity economy, and especially for, for our clients, we want access to an integrated range of services, and, and, and especially the clients have, have all the time opinions, and have an opinion that matters and, of course, great in influence. Hmm. Um, and so what, uh, how does it work exactly with the, the membership? Okay, well, La, la Mutual de, de Microfinance, finally, uh, is a legal entity of private, of private law with a quarter in Quebec City. But who can become members? There are basically three types of members. Users of products uh, who must pay, who must purchase, purchase a, a common share, $5. And we have preferred shares. Any holder of preferred shares, uh, having paid over $1 million, is a member too. And of course, Le, Le Fonds d'Emprunt Quebec is the third one. But the most important thing is that we have one member, we have one vote for each member. That mm -hmm. means also matter if you pay $1 million, $2 million, and me, just I, I have a, a small credit of $5,000 and I pay $5, well, we both will be members. And we have each one, one vote. So it's similar to a co-op model and it's one member, one vote. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so uh, in terms of your objectives, what you think you'll be able to achieve uh, if, with the, the mutual? Well, well, I have to say then we're going to change services to microcredit, microsavings, microinsurance, and training. And for the next, the next five years, we, we are expected to have $20 million in capitalization, more than 1000 a new clients, more than 3,000 loans application, and more than 3,000 job creators. And for our investors, we're looking for well, members, of course, uh, as I said, financial institutions, private foundations, private companies, and, and others. Those are, uh, that's an amazing, uh, very ambitious targets. So where are you now in terms of the startup process? Okay, we have stage completed, pre-startup. Uh, 
Well, the most important is a private act that was adopted on December the 7th. Uh, the, fund, the funding meeting, February, we have the board of directors, we have the mutual bylaw, we finish uh, documents and um, process, and we have the, our technological system. Uh, well, and, and coming soon is public launch of the mutual with the first member that, that we had and new services that, that are coming. We're, we're going to start with microcredit that we have, and before we're going to, to, to put to the market the insurance and savings. And of course, we, we haven't yet the new image. <laughs> yes. Well, that's uh, an amazing story of evolution, and uh, obviously the best is yet to come, so we'll be watching your website for more information on the launch. Thank you very much, Emilio. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, so I'd invite, once again, presenters to be uh, posing any questions you have for Emilio or about the Quebec microfinance mutual in the chat box, and we'll collect them. And in the meantime, we'll move on to our second presenter now, uh, Yvonne Poirier. Uh, Yvonne is the chair of SEDNET's International Committee and has been involved in international networking on CED and the social and solidarity economy since 1997. In his paid life, he was a college teacher and a union activist, but has always been very involved in his community, notably helping to set up the Quebec City CED Corporation between 1991 and 1994. And last fall, he accompanied uh, Ms. Fatimata Berry, who is the executive director of MECRPAG, on a study tour to Canada. So he's had the opportunity to get to know the project very well. Thank you for joining us, Yvon. Yes, hello. Great. So uh, you're going to explain how some similar cha challenges that uh, the Fonds des Banques Québec went through are driving another successful microfinance mutual in Africa. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'll add that I, I um, also am a member of the Fonds Africa Québec since it started in 1997. So I'm, I'm just uh, I've never had any official positions there, but I'm still a member and I support that organization, which was set up in the 90s. Excellent. Uh, yes. Um, Move on to the, next, the first slide. Yes, this is a, a mutual in uh, for fishing, artisanal fishing in in Guinea, in West Africa. We'll see in a moment. So, and we'll explain in a moment also why this was set up. But first of all, let's I'll move to the next slide. Where's this country? You can see in Africa in the West, West Africa, and you can see the the country uh, there with Conakry as capital, uh, as the capital of the country. And you can see, since we're talking about fishing here, it has a shoreline of about 300 kilometers. So there's a lot of fishing being done in that country. And uh, it's the main, this type of fishing is mostly, is the main input for protein for the country, uh, more than meat. So they, it's a lot of fishing which goes to the cities near the, the, the ocean. So it's very important uh, because, uh, as we'll see, the, the other type of fishing, which is a large, uh, uh, fishing ro uh, vessels come from other countries. It's all for export. So this is they fish for their own country in general. A little bit of uh, import, export also. They also export, as we'll see, uh, small fish. Mm. So Just want to mention right away yeah. that it's a very poor country. Uh, for example, outside the capital, there's no electricity, or except uh, people who have. Uh, machines and so forth. So it's a very, very poor country. It's very low on the world index. And the per capita income is $1,000, which and Canada's $40,000. So remember this figure, because we'll come back to this later on. Sure. So can you tell us what led to the creation of the MECAPAG? Yes. Uh, while we're looking at the slides here, uh, uh, they, they, they had uh, credit unions there, which were set up with help of the uh, Quebec uh, Desjardins movement. But the credit unions, like in Canada and U.S., they have savings and loans for members, but they can't lend to people who don't have, who are too, at much risk. They can't lend unless you have collateral or things like that. So the credit unions, the fisher, people in the fishing industry could not get loans from the credit unions. So, so they decided to create a mutual uh, on the same model as we have the new one in Quebec here, where 
the people in that industry, the fishermen, the women, and so forth, would get together and uh, run uh, mutual. And they realized that when they did a study on what was possible, they realized that there were savings that people had, but they were not putting their savings in banks or things like that. The savings were often hoarded. They had jewels and so forth. So they found that people did have some money they could, that could be used for lending. So this was important. From the, when they started this in 2007, they decided that they, in the longer term, they wanted to have uh, 17 uh, offices or uh, small union, credit unions in the fishing ports. There are 17 ports, and they are now in six. For, they had only one port, and since last year, they, had, they are now five other ports. So this is uh, important. And we'll see the membership later on, but like the Mutual in Quebec, has democratic governance. It's like a co-op. So they have a general assembly for all categories of members, and they elect the board of directors. So this is uh, an important factor. Uh, the initial step, I have to mention, the initial step, which is not mentioned here, came from the fishers union, fishing union itself. The fishermen wanted to express needs, and they connected with Unitero program, and this is why they did a study, and the, this is where they went forward. So you can see here there's a, uh, if it's a man speaking in front, most of the people in the room are women. So it's still, as we'll see later on, it's mostly a women's organization. And what did the project leaders want to achieve specifically by uh, creating the mutual? Yeah. Well, the, the goals that were established from the outset was uh, have uh, financial services, both savings and credit. There is a savings scheme also. Uh, that they have. It's not only credit. It's like uh, the one we just saw from Quebec. It's the same idea here. Uh, and as, as you can imagine, if a person has a, has some savings over time and the savings increase, uh, people that person can get better credit, a, high, a higher amount of credit. This is uh, like a part part of the collateral that's needed. Uh, from the outset, also they wanted to uh, strengthen women. Because the women are very important in the fishing industry, as we'll see. Because once the fish are landed, the women will take care of the rest. Uh, they wanted to do training for uh, the fishing industry, how to run, uh, manage a small business, and so forth. Uh, and so they wanted also to promote the sort of savings. They wanted to be viable to stay a longer time. And you, it's a, it's like in many uh, countries in the South and in West Africa, uh, the average uh, age of the people is very low, so there's uh, many, many young people who are unemployed. And also, since uh, f young people are not inclined maybe to go fishing that much, because it's a very uh, hard hard job, as in Canada, uh, they wanted to help the young people create jobs within that communi those communities. Working conditions, improve uh, income, and a better supply of fish for the population in the cities. That's a, a long list of objectives for uh, for the mutual. Is there a specific group that maybe uh, they were focusing on in particular? Well, no, they, they more or less looked at uh, all the people concerned. They wanted to create an organization where everybody involved in the fishing industry would be in. So they have women who smoke the fish and who the, the, the women are the fish dealers when the boat arrives they uh, uh, in the evening they the women take care of the fish bring it to the market bring it to the homes and bring it to be able to to, uh, to smoke the fish for export sometimes uh, fishing boat owners because uh, here uh, they also have an association, and they are members of the mutual. The mechanics, small boat big, uh, uh, builders, uh, the, the boats are about, we'll use here the English uh, term, uh, between 20 and 30, 20, 25 feet boat. They're very small boats. Uh, and also there are people who do export, they're members of the association, and everybody, anybody else interested. As we'll see later, uh, during part of the year, there's no fishing because the ocean is not fit for the small boats. So they do farming in those three or four months. So it's uh, 
it's, in other words, it's responding to the needs of all the, the different needs of the members. Here's some pictures here of some of those uh, people, in fact. Yeah, here are the fish are in the evening, fresh fish here, and the smoked fish here, they can see that they're doing this. And this type of boat, you can see the size of the boat here, it's very small. And on each, and you can see here on the left picture, these boats, they're about, when they go out in the morning, when light comes up, they're about 15 to 17 people on the boat. So it's very different than the type of fishing I was used to, and we can still see in Canada in the lobster or other industries. Hmm. So what services does the Mecapac offer to uh, its clientele? Yeah. As in other uh, microfinance organizations in the world, they usually start out with, with, the, with new members. They start out with a small loan, uh, let's say a three-month loan, and the first loan is a group loan. Let's say five women get together. They, let's say, uh, borrow, uh, we'll use Canadian dollars here, $1,000, and it'll be $200 each to be able to buy fish and uh, resell the fish and so forth uh, or do other types of things like that. And once they've repaid back the loan together, then they can move to individual loan. So because they have a good uh, credit uh, uh, Okay. Yeah, record. Mm -hmm. So this is how it starts. This is similar to other th other countries in the world where uh, the first cycle of loan, they call it, is usually a smaller loan and sometimes with groups. Okay. They, uh, does MicroPack also offer longer-term loans? Yes. Uh, it, they have three types of loans, as you can see in the next slide. Uh, Loans can be, on average, from 12 to 24 months. I think there's some loans that go up to 36. So they have commercial loans, for example, to a group, or like it can be a co-op, running, for example, a, a smoking uh, building, uh, or uh, boat builders and things like that. They have lease loans. This is very important because, as Ms. Barry was mentioning last fall, only about 25 to 3% of those small boats have uh, motors, so they buy they, they need outboard uh, motors. So they have uh, 25 or 40 horsepower motors, uh, Yamaha uh, outboard motors. And so the Mecopag uh, loans, uh, let's say they buy a boat, the, the motor, and they loan it to, to the fisherman. And after the loan is repaid, after the amount is, re is paid back to the Mecopag, the the woman or the man who owns a boat becomes the owner of the outboard motor. So it's a way, like it's what called a lease loan. Hmm. And there are investment loans for people who want to buy boats or things like that. For example, Ms. Barry was mentioning last fall that uh, over, over time, some of these women were able to uh, increase enough income to have capital so they could themselves buy boats. They, she, gave us, she gave me two examples of women who were did purchase a boat, and they were hiring men to go to the fishing, so hmm. they would keep more of the income. Right. How many um, people has the mutual helped so far to date? The figures here we have, I think, are 2011, so there might be a bit more. Hmm. Uh, there, are, there are organizations who are members, like uh, co-ops and uh, different associations in different regions of the country, and associations. Uh, yes, and 244 are... are uh, co-ops. Association can be association of uh, the fishermen themselves have uh, become members, and uh, probably the regional organizations centralized also have uh, become members. So altogether, as concerning individuals, that almost 3,000 and the, about 2,000 women. So two thirds of the members are women, and so far they have uh, 12 employees and four interns that can be volunteers from Unitera program or others. And they train people, and they go to the site, where, uh, places where the people are doing the fishing. So they train the men and the women uh, in the, each of the six uh, localities that they work in now. And I think you said earlier they are, have currently six service locations? Yes, uh, in the six of the ports, and they expect to go out to the 17 ports within a few few years. So this is one of the ports in the city called Kamsar. So you can see the, the 
proudly with volunteers and the Canadian uh, staff from Canada here. They, they have their local uh, uh, building here or office. The offices, by the way, are all in the ports or just near the ports. So it's, it's a, they go out to the people, and the people don't call, need to come out to the credit unions or the, the local. This is another one here. here. See in the picture on the left here, you can see a woman with, uh, with its money. That's actually a stack of cash she's got. Yeah, in because hand. in Guinea, it's a, uh, it's one, uh, it's the smallest bill probably is at one. I think it's one thousand uh, Guinea francs, but it takes seven thousand Guinea francs for one Canadian dollar. So it takes a huge amount of bills. And it might not be. It might only be two hundred dollars she has in her hand. Her hands there. And and they said that because the money is given out this way, it's actually usually public ceremonies and yes, uh, as the as loan is awarded. And see, this woman is very proud to be able to have this loan. And uh, mm -hmm. here, some of the young guys there, and again, a type of boat that they fish in. Right. So can you, just to wrap up then, give us some numbers as an idea for the size or the scope of uh, Micropag's activities? Yes. In 2011, they had equity of $70,000. And I remind you that when we started, I said that uh, the per capita income was 40 times lower. So if you, to compare with something equivalent in Canada, we could multiply by 40. So it would be uh, two point, uh, over $2 million in Canadian dollars if we were in Canada. And the uh, volume of loans, if you multiply by 40, it would be $4 million. So in other words, for that country, these are impressive figures considering the per capita income. So I can see here, that, and uh, most of the uh, loans, volume of loans, is over 75% to, to women. As I was explaining, the women really are being empowered by this, more than the men who do the fishing, uh, it's, uh, except those who own their own boats, because a lot of the men do work on, on salaries. And they even some of the people in the fishing industry they mentioned are uh, sell the, the fish to uh, big trawlers that come in outside the, uh, the outside the water. So it's uh, really the women who are being strengthened here. And as I mentioned, they become even owners of their own uh, fishing boats once this, this, this has started. So so this is this is um, they were very they, they are very uh, let's put it this way they're very glad of what they've done so far mm -hmm. and we see here that the number of clients 2834 that's the same number as the number of members we saw earlier and I guess that's the principle of the mutual is that the clients are also the member owners yes. of the and more, yes and some of the members are just just have savings mm -hmm. uh, and others have loans in other words um, um, it's more than just uh, microcredit. It, since they have a savings plan, and people don't, you can have a loan, you provide a loan, and, w and then maybe that person has enough uh, income or um, cash to be able to just have savings, and they doesn't need to have a new loan. So it's uh, like a credit union in a sense. It's like a co-op in that sense. Mm. Well, it's a fascinating story and a marvelous example of uh, mobilizing local assets uh, to uh, extend, you know, their own control and influence on on their their own development. So, thank you, Yvonne. Yeah, I can just mention that I'll be visiting them next week. Oh yes, lucky guy. <coughs> uh, well, well, uh, well. Wait to hear more about. Uh, hopefully, we'll have more pictures to post after <laughs> that visit. That'd be great. So. Um, so we're going to move into the question period now. There's already a couple of very good questions posted, and others can uh, add them to the chat box as we go. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I will unsync the presentation, which means that from here on in, participants, you should be able to scroll back and forth through the presentation um, and revisit some of the slides that maybe went too quickly uh, previously as we were going through them. And we'll start with the questions. So I'll start with the first one from Fred of the Saskatchewan Cooperation, Cooperative Association, a very practical question relating to the startup experience of the Mutuelle de Microfinance in Quebec. 
Um, so this would be for you, Emilio. He wondered how long it took to get the legislation in place. Uh, who did you work with? How much did it cost? Can you just tell us a bit about how that happened? Okay. Uh, we started in, in 2009, but I have to say that it was necessary to resort to our lawyers who helped us develop a whole special act inspired by Mutual Insurance Act and act respecting trust company and saving companies. This involved long hours of work, the support of many sectors, and many meetings with major institutions to shape it. It was a very important stage and, and quite difficult. But right now, I don't, I don't have the cost here, but it's amazing. It's almost three years to be Three years worth of work. And do you, do you do, was, this, was any of it pro bono, or were you paying for the expertise in most cases? In most cases, we have to pay. Pay for it, yeah. So I think there might be, I, I, I think I'm familiar with instances where either um, sitting MLAs or MPs might have access to legislative drafting expertise where they could seek some support. So if you have friends in the right places, you might be able to get some help with uh, specific ideas. But uh, in many cases, it is a very complex and highly skilled kind of um, approach. So uh, it, there, undoubtedly, there would be some costs involved. So it's about three years' worth of work. That's worth keeping in mind uh, to get a private member's bill passed. And of course, you, it was on the verge of being passed when the government fell once and it had to be reintroduced. Uh, so it's uh, always at the whims of the political process as well. Um, OK, another. Um, question related to the delivery of the services for the Quebec Microfinance Mutual from Susanna in Edmonton. Emilio, will the savings and insurance products be offered in partnership with a financial institution or directly by the mutual uh, yourselves? Uh, if we're talking about insurance, we are going to, to, to work with a partner. We're, we're going to customize the products and, and about savings, we're going to start with a partner, and then we're going to change. We're going to do it by, by ourselves, because our app allows us to do this. Mm. So a first step for the savings will be to work with a partner while you get your systems and uh, a capacity in place to be able to take it over yourselves. Yes, but the insurance we have to do all the time with a partner. Right. And just a background point related to the insurance is that one of the challenges I think that the Fonds d'Emprunt Québec had previously was that it required insurance for its uh, loan applicants, which they often had a difficult time getting. Yes, <laughs> yes, of course. So uh, now being able to provide it yourselves uh, means you have, have a, not only an immediate clientele, but uh, a uh, specialized product to be able to offer them that they'll have access to. And cheaper, of course. <laughs> uh, very good. Um, OK, from uh, Sylvie Waugh, uh, or Roy, probably. I shouldn't pronounce it as a Quebecer, because Sylvie's from India, studying in Toronto, was asking about the interest rate. I think, Yvonne, this is for you with respect to the Mecropag example. The interest rate on different types of loans, and if the interest goes back into the fund or how it's used. Um, I don't have that information. Uh, all I know is it's. The average uh, uh, in uh, southern countries would be about 20, 25 percent, I suppose. Hmm. But it would, say, for, since they own part of their savings, they have they have provide their own capital. That part would be uh, they would save. I know that they have they can also get uh, soft loans from the government. They, they is or international agency. So they do have, they can have uh, funds which are not very expensive. So in that case, it means little would flow away and the rest would stay within the mutual. But I can't give you more than that for now, but I'll, within the next two weeks from now, I'll have that answer. That, that question would probably be applicable also for uh, the Fonds des Plans Québec. Uh, Emilio, in terms of the interest that you charge on your loans, what happens to that? How is that used? Okay, we we build a credit scoring, and well, uh, our interest rate is between eight and fourteen. Okay, it's less than the, than a credit card. <laughs> right. Yes, eight and fourteen percent, depending on the credit scoring of the individual, and. Uh, 
the interest that you collect on your loans, is that used for the Fond d'Emprunt Quebec operating costs, or does it pull, plowed into the loan fund? What do you do with it? Yeah, well, it's, it's for operation. Operation costs, okay. Um, and the next question from Lay, if I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that uh, uh, right, Lay. How does the interest rate for loans um, for both organizations compare to standard banks or credit unions? So, Emilio, you just said that your interest rate is lower than credit card um, compared to Desjardins or other standard banks and credit unions people might go to. How does it compare? Well, we think we're in, we're in, in the same level. Right. Yeah. In the same ballpark, but the main point being that um, they, these applicants would typically have already been refused. They wouldn't have access to credit from a mainstream bank. Yes. And part of the challenges, of course, with microcredit is that the transaction costs tend to be quite a bit higher for the small amounts that you're involved with. So, um, uh, And the main difference, is, of course, is the educational program that we have. Is the what, sorry? The educational program that we have. Okay, and that's the education that you training that you provide to borrowers in terms of developing their business plan, or yes. Okay. Um, you won't hear now that uh, it's the same thing in Guinea in the sense that they can't access uh, any credit. So I mean, it's uh, for them, it's uh, there's no comparison. But otherwise, they they, they can't. Uh, I would add something here uh, we were mentioning yesterday, because yesterday we had a, this same uh, presentation in French. I think we need to add something else here, because we important. It's the same thing in Guinea and in Quebec. It's more than uh, uh, money. It's more than finance here. And what people have found out in Guinea, and yesterday uh, CEO of uh, Fondapa was explaining this also, is that these people who might not earn that much more, have, uh, are actively in the workforce. They are proud of what they're doing. They are seeing that they're making progress. They are linked to other organizations. So it's the persons themselves who often are, are very poor or low income. They become proud of being involved. And they, they have their tra in both organizations, there's training and so forth. This is the impact on the community it's important here. It's mm -hmm. more than finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's hard to measure those kinds of outcomes. Eh? Yeah. But they're extremely important. Um, the next question from uh, Ali asked about the loan default rate. I think, uh, Emilio, in one of your slides, you talked about a repayment rate uh, in the in the over 90 percent. Eh? Yeah, sorry, yes. <laughs> Not a 1 percent reimbursement. So that uh, does that mean that the inverse is a, a nine percent default rate? I guess. Yes. Right, uh, Yvonne, do you have a sense of? No, I don't have the figures. I'm quite sure it's it's very low. I'm very sure it's extremely low. Mm -hmm. Which it tends to be the uh, um, the strength of those microcredit kind of approaches is because it's uh, there's a lot of social capital involved and a lot of connection and very close to the process. There's the pressure and uh, um, support for the, the you know good decisions and sound business yeah. management to make sure that the money isn't lost. Yeah, I could add that this is just thinking out loud here. Uh, in Canada, people who can't access loans in regular financial institutions, and as uh, Emilio was mentioning, they are fairly low-income people, sometimes very low-income people. They've been unemployed, or some of them have been on welfare, and so forth. In Guinea, it would be different because in Guinea, it would be 80% of people who are poor. Hmm. So uh, for them, it's uh, let's put it this way: it's like mainstream people who are very poor. So it's uh, it's not just a sub sector, or a sub part of the society. It's uh, it's in society in general, almost who's in this situation. Okay. Um, next question from Jasmine in New Brunswick uh, about group lending. And so in terms of group lending, do people in the group have separate businesses or do they all work for the same business? And I know, Yvonne, you mentioned this, but let's start with uh, Emilio. D does the Fond d'Emprunt Québec or 
the mutual, well, is it expected to do any lending to groups or is it mostly individuals? No, mostly individuals, not uh, lending to groups. Primarily individuals. So, uh, Yvonne, in Re terms of Mecropex group lending, do you know how that works? What it, it would be the same. He, a group of women get together and uh, she was telling me last fall that they almost not every day, but very often people come and they know that to get into the system of the mutual, they need to start with the group loan. So five women get together, they, uh, they don't need to outreach, they come to, they, people come to them, and, and, uh, and for example, these women who get the fish when they arrive in the evening, each woman, instead of borrowing money, buy the fish from the fishermen, she'd have, uh, she'd have, these funds will be used to buy the fish and resell the fish. So it would be five different uh, very, very uh, small entrepreneurs. It would be uh, for each in individual. You have to hear, especially the selling the fish, in general it would be uh, each person doing this. It would be uh, each woman going and selling the fish. It would be, you know, it would be, be separate, different. Okay. Would be, I doubt it would be different with the credit union or something else. A group already existing would be different. They'd have commercial loans, as we were mentioning. But the first initial loans, which can then lead to private loans, right. it would be individuals. Okay. So the individuals in a group uh, working together for that first step. Um, now a question for Emilio from uh, Molina. Uh, you mentioned technological changes or innovations that are going to be required, I think, for the next, for the launch of the mutual. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some of those systems? Okay, we change our main software here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and, and as I said, we're going to start with a partner in savings, and before we're going to change to mobile, uh, to internet, that, that will be amazing. We have a, a, a big map to work on it. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that sounds um, a bit intimidating in terms of the, the technology, but once uh, you have it in place, I'm sure it would uh, greatly enhance efficiencies for managing the, the different services and the case files as they move across those services. Um, as, and then uh, I have one more question on the list here, this one from Sylvie, uh, asking about how the credit score of individuals be determined. I think you mentioned that, uh, Emilio, that interest rates are determined on a credit score? Yes, we have, we, we have a credit scoring that uh, each month we, 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 we are reviewing and, and in fact right now we, we, are changing, we are changing our credit scoring. We're working with two professors of uh, La Université Laval. They are helping us to, to build a, a bigger and better, sorry, and better system. But uh, we have almost 100 uh, variables to, to, to check. It's mm. a pretty thorough. And then I guess one final follow-up question that Maya just posted is... I, I want to add something about sure. Macropide. Yep. What they do there is that in each mm -hmm. of the local uh, offices, they have a credit committee made up of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And each, non, each applicant is... Uh, each loan, each application for a loan is studied by this committee. And uh, it's mostly, here it wouldn't change the interest rate. It would, what would change here would be approve the, rate, the loan or not. So, and, this are, and since our, these people who are in the credit committee also live in the community, they all know each other, uh, it's partly, well, as the person repaid previous loans, of course, otherwise he wouldn't get a new loan, but it's the reputation of the person. Is it a, I mean, it's like knowing the persons around. It's very different than uh, credit committees in Canada where, for example, in credit unions, people on, on the credit committees, I uh, was, we were visiting, Ms. Berry was with me, we were visiting credit union PEI. The credit committee doesn't know the name of the person who's asking for a loan. It's just a business plan, whatever. So he, over there is all the, it's information which is shared. And of course, the people who are elected in the, on the credit committees need to be, uh, let's put it this way, uh, people who are well respected by everybody. Hmm. All right. Well, um, I guess one 
detailed question here from Maya, and then we'll wrap up, is, uh, uh, Emilio, do um, the loans that are repaid, for example, back to the Fonds d'Emploi Québec, do you report to credit rating agencies or bureaus in order to improve credits, a client's credit scores? Right, right now, you, you uh, we're just reporting bad loans. Okay. So that's uh, something to perhaps to consider, especially as the scope of services gets ramped up uh, in the in the mutual. So we're just about out of time. Um, we've covered an awful lot of ground. I'll rethink the presentation there and post some links for more information on the Quebec Loan Fund, the Quebec Microfinance Mutual, and uh, Micropag. Also, everyone should have just received an email with a link to a one-minute evaluation survey. Please take a few seconds and fill it out uh, right now. Your feedback is very important to us, particularly because we have uh, more webinars coming and we always are looking to improve. These two uh, webinars are, are coming up in the next uh, one in two weeks and another just over a month, so register now if you're interested. There are also many more events, webinars, workshops, and conferences being organized by our members and others across Canada that are listed on our website calendar. So there's a link for that at the bottom of this slide. Feel free to check that out. Finally, thank you, uh, many thanks once again to Emilio and Yvonne for their thoughtful presentations today in at least second, if not the third language, so an additional challenge that they carried out admirably. And a special thanks to Unitera for the support of the webinar and SEDNET's international activities. And of course, thank you to all the participants for very interesting questions and participation. The webinar recording and presentations will be posted on our website in the coming days, and we'll send you the links as soon as they're available. The webinar will conclude here, and participants who are interested in joining us for the reaction session can stay online, and I'll post the dial-in info in a few seconds. For those leaving, thanks for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.